Recently in Portsmouth, I was in the shop and chatting to uh, a couple of customers, uh, one of which was a G3. And uh, I should, ex should explain that G3 means you've been licensed quite a long time. <laughs> in my case, I was licensed back in 1960. Anyway, we got talking about some of the gear that we used to use in the old days, and it just reminded me that I had actually done a short video showing some of the, I suppose you might call it museum gear, we have on our shelves uh, in the Portsmouth Warehouse. And I thought, well, I've done this video, but I haven't actually published it. So I thought this is a good time to actually publish the video and just have a brief uh, chat about the old days. Not a long video, so don't worry. So take a look at this. I'm this time in a corner of our warehouse in uh, Portsmouth. It's a very big warehouse and there's all sorts of interesting things tucked away and it's, this is an area which I haven't actually looked at for quite a while and it takes you back in time to the uh, early days of ham radio. Um, there's some of the shots so uh, you can see here of the equipment that we've got got uh, HROs, a lot of 1155s, uh, 1154 transmitter, some American gear, Eddystone, uh, KW radio, um, several KW radios actually, Panda Cub and all sorts of uh, all sorts of radios. It does sort of, you know, it's amazing really that when I come to think of it that a lot of this gear was the gear that I had the opportunity of using um, in the early days of radio. Now, uh, I can remember in 1960 uh, wanting an HRO, one of these HROs. I'd love to have had one of these HROs, but I just couldn't afford it. And um, we've, uh, well, we've got quite a range of equipment here which takes, uh, takes you through the uh, 50s, 60s and 70s as, as ham radio was then, because there wasn't very much ready-built ham radio equipment. We had to use uh, wartime equipment um, that uh, we modified and repaired because very often it didn't work anyway. But one thing that really amazes me is that the DX that we managed to work with this equipment. Now, it looks complicated. There's lots of knobs and buttons and so forth, but the basic design was a Superhet receiver uh, with an RF amplifier, uh, the VFOs, whether it be on the transmit side or receiver side, were free running, they weren't locked to anything, so it was quite normal to experience drift, and I can remember having QSOs where you just went up and down the band chasing each other, and uh, the topic of conversation was indeed, uh, how much drift have you got, this sort of thing, or how much distortion have you got, uh, what sort of sideband suppression? Is your carrier suppressed? Is it mulled out? You know, the, these sort of things were topics of conversation. But it does seem to me that if we were able to work that sort of DX with these sort of basic receivers, then probably conditions in the 1960s and 70s were better than they are now. Now, I can't prove that. I can't prove that at all. But you have to appreciate that today's equipment is high performance, very sensitive receivers, very good dynamic range. And yet, are we actually working that much more DX than we were in the 1960s or 70s? I really don't know. Perhaps you've got a view on it, I don't know. But um, it just seems to me that radio conditions on the HF bands are perhaps not what they were in what I would perhaps call the heyday in the 60s and 70s when we were SSB was fairly new and um, we hadn't conquered drift and all those sort of things that uh, now we take for granted I mean if, we, if our radio drifted more than sort of 10 or 20 Hertz we'd be worried but in those days it might have drifted a couple of kilohertz and the calibration was nothing to write home about and in fact uh, we, we didn't have digital displays by and large uh, so the frequency control and the frequency readout was very well basic. Uh, I suppose occasionally we operated outside the band, I don't know, who knows? Anyway, it's interesting to look at this uh, old gear and um, well, it's just a memory now. Thanks for watching.